Welcome, everybody. I'm Gabriel Rosenfeld, the president of the Center for Jewish History, and um, also a professor of history at Fairfield University. I'm very happy to welcome everybody to today's uh, discussion between Helmut Walzer Smith and Michael Brenner. It's uh, our continuing series of talks by um, current fellows here at the Center for Jewish History. And we're very glad that everybody is here with us um, to hear Helmut and Michael discuss uh, a chapter from Helmut's um, forthcoming um, book, ongoing book project, um, entitled Karl Adler's Butenhausen, Mourning, Memory, and Property in the Early Federal Republic. Um, if uh, I could get Helmut and Michael to uh, activate their videos. Greetings, Helmut. Greetings, Michael. Uh, welcome to everybody once again. Um, before giving my formal introductions, I'd just like to note on a personal level uh, how pleased I am that Helmut has been uh, this year's NEH scholar at the Center for Jewish History. We have a wonderful cohort of six scholars, uh, junior and senior. Uh, they're all working on various research projects. Uh, and in our um, twice monthly um, sessions uh, in our uh, graduate fellows lounge, where we workshop chapters, Helmut's been really a, a, a unique resource, uh, an invaluable critic uh, and uh, commentator on all the works we've been discussing. It's been a real ple pleasure for me to get to know him better over the course of this past year, uh, and the occasional lunch doesn't hurt either. In any case, uh, Helmut, very much, uh, very, very much glad you're here uh, today. And um, I would also like to say on a personal level how glad I am that Michael's with us as well. Uh, he and I have known each other for at least 20 years and have spent a great number of uh, opportunities and uh, occasions um, both academic uh, and social, um, spending time together in Munich, uh, in Boston, in New York, um, and as two of the most renowned scholars of German and German Jewish history, uh, we're really quite fortunate that both of them are with us today. So welcome to you both. Welcome to everyone uh, on the Zoom. Let me now turn to uh, Michael and Helmut's official credentials. Helmut Walzer Smith is the Martha Rivers Ingram Professor of History at Vanderbilt University, and he's currently, as I mentioned, the NEH Scholar in Residence here at the Center for Jewish History. His many books have appeared in six languages and include, among others, German Nationalism and Religious Conflict, Culture, Ideology, Politics, 1870 to 1914, which appeared with Princeton in 1995, The Butcher's Tale, Murder and Anti-Semitism in a German Town, which appeared in 2002, and which I've assigned at least half a dozen times to my students, uh, and more recently, Germany, a Nation in its Time, Before, During, and After Nationalism, which appeared in 2020. He's currently working on a book with the tentative title, Local Truth, How Jews and Germans Made the Memory Culture of the Federal Republic. And it's truly uh, exciting to be able to be with him uh, on a uh, weekly basis, hearing how um, his research is uh, progressing. Michael Brenner uh, holds the Chair of Jewish History and Culture at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. And he's also the Distinguished Professor, professor of History and Seymour and Lillian Abinson Chair in Israel Studies at American University. He's also, by the way, the International President of the Leo Beck Institute for the Study of German Jewish History. He's the author of 10 books that have been translated into over a dozen languages, the latest being In Hitler's Munich, Jews, the Revolution, and the Rise of Nazism, which appeared with Princeton University Press in 2022, and which, by the way, uh, has just received a glowing review by none other than Helmut Smith in the latest issue of Antisemitism Studies. So lest you think that uh, the world of academia is an enormous world where no one ever uh, meets one another, that would be, of course, disproved by that um, recent uh, piece. Um, one last bit of housekeeping, if everyone can please uh, put their questions into the Q&A um, icon at the bottom of the screen when we get to the question and answer session. That would be wonderful. Uh, and without further ado, um, let's allow uh, Helmut Walzer Smith to come out of the uh, Southwest Germany and uh, tell you a little bit about his ongoing project. Helmut, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gav. Um, 
Thank you also to the Center for Jewish History. Uh, it's a real honor for me. Thank you to uh, the Leo Beck Institute and its director, uh, Markus Kra. And thank you to Miriam, who is, uh, Laura, who is the director of the academic and public programs uh, here. As well, uh, it has been a wonderful year for me here in New York, exploring the city. Um, thank you to the NEH for uh, making this possible, uh, to the staff of this, uh, of the center for making it enjoyable and to the fellows really for making it a, a lively intellectual exchange um, over the past months. And of course, to, to Michael, yes, we all know each other and still um, uh, to Michael uh, for agreeing to comment on this project. Now, what I'm gonna read from today is really the fourth chapter of a book. Unfortunately, well, uh, the book tends to change its, its uh, title uh, every few weeks. Um, at the moment, the book is called Our Hometowns, Jews, Germans, and the Fight for Local Truth in the Federal Republic, 1945 to, um, to 2000. Let me, before I launch into the chapter, just say a few things about the book itself. And to that end, I um, will have to share the screen. Uh, and I hope I share the right screen. No, I think I've just shared the wrong one. No, it's okay. Sorry, I knew this was going to happen, but something did. Um, so this is a project that begins really with a map, uh, the map that you see up about burned, uh, 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 destroyed and desecrated synagogues in Nazi Germany, 1938. Um, and I was very interested in the question of when uh, the cities and towns of Germany um, got around to in some way commemorating um, this event, uh, this injustice perpetrated. And I did this because I thought that this would give me a sort of a, a, a chronological a timeline for understanding the emergence of memory culture in Germany. As I did this, I found that first of all, uh, more than two thirds of the synagogues destroyed and desecrated were in small towns. Um, but so too, I also discovered uh, were uh, many of the memorials. And as you can see from the map of Baden-Württemberg, um, it is also true of many of these smaller town memorials. Many of them, um, in a way, there's a plaque or something put up before 1980, before the, the genuine explosion in West, in West Germany's memory culture. So I started to, to look at these and I discovered two things. One is that some of them um, were in, in these really small places and it was hard to figure out why, who, and so I began to dig uh, into the archives. When I did this, one of the first things I did is I used the Leo Beck Institute database. And there I started to discover that there were lots of family papers that told me about um, this. And as I dug deeper and deeper, I realized that um, very much, it's very much the case that German memory culture um, was something like a joint venture. And it involved not just Germans in Germany, but also um, Jews who returned um, from the camps if they survived, but also Jews in the diaspora. And so I began to see this as, um, as a project participated in, in various ways, differently in different times um, across, um, across time, participated in by both Germans and Jews. This is now the fourth chapter um, and I'm starting in the uh, 1950s now. And the earlier chapters were largely about the survivors uh, coming back to their hometowns. So let me begin.
On a Sunday afternoon, mid-July 1961, the sun pressed through the gray clouds as a small group of people assembled around a memorial stone southwest in the southwest German village of Buttenhausen. Set among rolling hills and verdant pastures, this village of less than a thousand souls belonged to a small but significant group of German communities in which as many Jews as Christians lived, at least during the middle and second third of the 19th century. Travelers in the early 20th century could still see something of this rich history of living together. As they came into town, they would notice that the Protestant church stood raised on one side of the Lauter River, while a synagogue hugged the steep slope on the other. The synagogue did not survive the Nazi period, but the Jewish burial ground did. And as people assembled on that summer day in 1961, the two cemeteries, one Christian, one Jewish, still faced each other across the valley. The memorial stone around which the crowd gathered commemorated the Buttenhausen Jews deported to their deaths during the Holocaust. In the darkest days of the Nazi regime, six separate deportations departed from Buttenhausen. Only one Jewish person survived any of them. In this context, a stone, quote, in memory of our friends and relatives who vanished in the Holocaust, unquote, may seem a cold, an inert entry into a history of persecution and suffering. But this was no ordinary memorial. It counted among the first public markers of the deportations in the Federal Republic of Germany. It was situated in a public place, not a Jewish cemetery, as had been the case with all such, all earlier such stones. And it listed the names of those whom the Nazis deported and murdered, starting with the man who served as the village rabbi, Naftalia Berlinger. How did this remarkable memorial stone come into existence in such a small village? And what does it tell us about how Germans faced the past in the early decades of the Federal Republic? The story starts not in Buttenhausen, but in the Bronx with Karl Adler, a slender but imposing man with a chiseled face and a deep baritone voice. In August, 1955, he returned to his hometown of Buttenhausen for the first time since escaping Germany in 1940. He was born here in 1890 and grew up as one of three children in a house at the center of the village. His father was a beloved local cantor, and so we may imagine his home filled with the sounds of songful prayer. Yet Carl was the real musical star of the family, and as a late teenager, he became a celebrated opera singer at the Württemberg Court Theater until a head wound received as a soldier during World War I forced him to give it give up his singing career. Irrepressible, Karl went on to become the director of the new conservatory of music in Stuttgart. And along with Otto Hirsch, the co-founder in 1926 of the capital city's Jüdisches Lehrhaus, the Jewish House of Learning. When the Nazis came to power, they immediately dismissed Adler from the directorship of the conservatory. Undeterred, Adler formed the, uh, die Stuttgarter Jüdische Kunstgemeinschaft, the Stuttgart Jewish Art Association. In Württemberg, people also knew Karl Adler in a non-musical capacity. He was the head of the so-called Mittelstelle, or Mediation Bureau, which served as a liaison between the Jewish community of Württemberg on the one side and the Nazis on the other, especially in matters relating to Jewish emigration. As the head of this office, and under the surveillance of both the Gestapo and the Sicherheitsdienst, Adler did a great deal of good. As he himself put it in a letter to his Stuttgart friends in 1948, the mediation office, quote, helped the politically persecuted and endangered Jews get across the border illegally, saved hundreds of people from the concentration camps and protected them from deportation. Some Jews could not be saved or protected. To their families, Karl's wife, Greta, wrote the cards of condolence. If Adler had experienced the Nazis at their most duplicitous, he nevertheless thought of his native village of Buttenhausen as an oasis of goodwill in a desert of ill intent. He had good reason to think this way. In Buttenhausen, not a few Christians helped in dark times. There was, for example, the old village mayor, Hans Hirler, a little bit blurred here, a complex figure. Although a member of the Nazi party, Hirler had defended, pistol in hand, the Buttenhausen synagogue against SA detachments from nearby Münzingen on the night of November 9, 1938. And only on the second attempt, a day later with Hirler under house arrest, did the Nazis 
burned down the Buttenhausen synagogue. Taylor then negotiated to get the right uh, to get the eight local Jewish men whom the Nazis arrested out of concentration camp uh, in Dachau. He also forged all manner of papers, including birth certificates, that would help Jews get out of the country. To Jews in dire need, he passed on food stamps, otherwise intended for the military. And to those Jews being deported, he gave food and sustenance, even accompanying them in the first part of their transport to Stuttgart to the step. After that, it was to the concentration camps. Moreover, Hitler was not the only one. There was Karl and Maria Pflatt, Paul and Martha Stäbler, Gerhard Hascher and his wife, and Ludwig Walz, who had been a longtime Protestant mayor nearby Catholic Riedlingen, and who made food deliveries once a week to the aging and pressed Jews of Buttenhausen, for which, by the way, he was later recognized by Yad Vashem as one of Germany's comparatively few righteous among nations. Yet in August 1955, Carl and his wife Greta walked through this village with pain in their hearts. Wherever they looked, the streets were bereft of bustle, empty storefronts bleakened the sidewalks, and neglected Jewish houses, quote, were not anymore home to a single Jew. In the 1930s, as Jews desperately left Germany, they tried to sell off these houses, but even at scandalously marked down prices, too few Christians in the village of Buttenhausen could afford them. The city of Stuttgart bought these houses instead. In the course of the day, Adlers, the Adlers discovered difficult truths about this village. They learned that the SS stole a great deal of Jewish property and that the nearby town of Minzingen auctioned it off. They heard that local Jews also broke into homes of Jews, uh, I'm sorry, they heard that local Christians also broke into the homes of Jews and made away with baskets of silverware, brass candlesticks, jewelry, and much else. They also came to understand in Adler's words that, quote, in a number of cases, so-called friends and neighbors plundered the apartments right in front of the eyes of these desperate people and were not ashamed to steal their glasses right from their face. The Adlers were also distressed by how many people seemed to have already put the past behind them. The human tragedy, Carl noted a mere decade after the end of the Holocaust was already forgotten. At best, they commented upon the economic decline of the village and linked it to the absence of the Jewish population. The young were no different. They, quote, hardly know anything about the terrible events of those times, as was true for the survivors who came back to Heigeloch in 1945, handled in an earlier chapter. Carl Adler's return to Puttenhaus in the mid-50s unsettled him profoundly. The only place where I felt at home, he admitted, was the cemetery. Adler also realized, as he put it, that something must be done. In discussions with the new village mayor, Otto Greta, the Protestant pastor, Johannes Hazelov, and an old friend, Otto Meyer, Adler proposed a memorial plot. The quote should contain the names of those deported and who died or killed far away from their homeland, unquote. Remarkably, the three men from Buttenhausen agreed. The mayor even promised that Buttenhausen would take care of the plaque. But the plan had to be brought up before the village council. Mayor Greta assured Adler that his office would keep him informed. Satisfied, if saddened by his visit, Adler returned to New York and awaited the news. But none came. In March 1956, Adler wrote back. And again, there was silence. He then asked an old friend to inquire. Then another, and still no news. By the summer of 1957, it had become clear that the village was unwilling. Adler felt sure that the village council had taken a hostile stance and assumed that the Puttenhausen strategy of, quote, passive resistance would put an end to the memorial. Adler was right to be concerned. In this strikingly beautiful village where once Jews and Christians lived as neighbors, a cold, damp, oppressive resentment had settled in. Property was the vexing issue. Alone in Little Buttenhausen, there were some 40 cases of restitution pending. This meant that who owned what remained an open question in close to a third of the local houses. And this at a time when they were sorely needed, 
as refugees, ethnic Germans expelled from Eastern Europe, had poured into town. All the homes had been purchased at ordinary local prices, just as if from Christian to Christian, the village council had asserted. And for this reason, quote, there can be no talk of appropriation or even stealing. Moreover, the Jewish community was in decline even before Hitler came to power. Eventually, Jewish property would have to be auctioned off anyways, the council opined. In what became a general statement about restitution and property, the council reasoned as follows, quote, it contradicts any sense for justice when one makes those who purchase property in good faith responsible for the damages that the Jews suffered from the side of the Third Reich. After all, they, the Jews, are not the only ones to lose the war, unquote. Easy to see in the village council's opinion of false equivalency, but this would overlook the emotional and indeed tragic dimension of local resentment. As in other towns and villages, Buttenhausen lost the best of its young men. The village registered almost 40 fallen soldiers, 13 of them missing, almost everyone killed in the East, and more than three quarters of them falling late in the war, at the time of Stalingrad or after. Moreover, the villages resented the very judicial basis of restitution claims. When one speaks from one side of a collective demand, there, is, there has to be on the other, a collective guilt, the village council reasoned. For the Christians of Buttenhausen, the reference to collective guilt no doubt hardened their resentment. Hardly a phrase in the German language at that time met with such an obstreperous chorus of rejection. In Buttenhausen, the small shopkeepers and poor peasants could shrug their shoulders at high level debates over societal complicity in Nazi crimes. But when it came to having to pay again for the very homes they lived in, as restitution sometimes demanded, that was another matter altogether. Most Christians simply did not have the money. This was in part because Buttenhausen, once one of the richest villages in the region, had become one of the poorest. Through trade and their connections to larger towns and cities, Jews in the pre-Nazi period had brought considerable wealth to the village. This wealth, however, unevenly spread, had completely evaporated. Suddenly, Buttenhausen was like any other village only poor. Contextual arguments only get us so far. A meaner street, harder to understand, also animated local defiance. On August 5th, 1950, the village council debated a state and county level request that the village repair and take care of the Jewish cemetery, including putting a fence around. The village council initially demurred, then concurred and begrudgingly enclosed the graveyard. <coughs> but over time, the burden of taking care of the Jewish cemetery was too much. The fence was falling apart. Bushes grew a while between the graves. Weeds covered the stone and grass surged tall, thick and untamed. When a more formal request came in 1958, after the question of who actually owns the cemeteries had been settled throughout Germany, the village council debated the matter again. The village is, in, is not in a position to use the community's money for the care of the Israelite cemetery, one council member said, quote, we have enough to do with our own cemetery, unquote. Another pointed to a labor shortage, saying there were hardly enough workers to bring in the harvest. Taking care of the cemetery would definitely mean an ongoing aggravating burden on the community, the, co the critics within the council insisted. Karl Adler, Karl Adler felt the chill of local indifference and it forced him to look elsewhere for help. The person he turned to was Otto Bernheimer, the son of Leopold Bernheimer, the court supplier of antiquities for Leopold, Prince Regent of Bavaria. In the decades before World War I, the family had gifted Buttenhausen, a non-sectarian vocational middle school, the so-called Bernheimische Realschule, and had put up money for the electrification of the village. Returning to Munich from South America after the Holocaust, Otto Bernheimer built, rebuilt his father's business, creating one of the great auction houses of Germany, a Bavarian suburb, which specialized in antique furniture, European paintings, and Asian sculpture. 
In the post-war period, Otto had also returned to Buchenhausen, twice in fact, and he too learned that the beloved native village of his family was no island of virtue. In an exchange of letters in July 1957, the two men discussed Adler's idea for a memorial. Bernheimer supported it and suggested that the names of the deported and murdered Jews in Buttenhausen be put on a tablet at the portal of the school his father had given to the uh, community back in 1903. The recalcitrant village council could not object as the school no longer belonged to the community but had relapsed to a trust in the possession of the Bernheimer family. By September, it had become no longer clear that who actually owned the property. And all of this became a more complex matter than initially supposed. Moreover, the school portal was not large enough to support a tablet that could carry all the names of all the murdered Jews of this village. Another possibility was to place a memorial in the Jewish cemetery. Some evidence suggests that Buttenhausen would have conceded to this measure. Such a concession would not have been negligible. After all, neighboring Buchau, about which I write in an earlier chapter, fell silent when Moritz Fierfelder from Youngstown, Ohio, inquired into this possibility for his own hometown. But for Karl, the Jewish cemetery in Buttenhausen was simply too out of the way and is never visited by the population. The memorial project now began to involve ever wider circles of people. In November 1958, the so-called Buttenhausen Evening, the first of a number of local groups of Württemberg Jews that met in New York on a regular basis, met to approve the idea of a memorial stone and to begin the work of figuring out the names of the Jews deported and killed. Who was to pay for such a memorial stone? Where was it to be located? And what should such a stone look like? Otto Bernheimer solved the first problem by writing a check for 6,000 German marks and the Jews of the Buttenhausen uh, evening did its bit by essentially passing around the hat to pay for the rest. The question of where was more difficult. Adler turned to Stuttgart. He knew the city owned considerable property in the village. Maybe he also worked on that aspect of things. Stuttgart opened its arms to his request. Now one might think that Stuttgart's openness reflected the greater cosmopolitanism of the city versus the countryside. But there was a deeper reason too, and it leads us to the heart of the anti-Nazi resistance. Adler did not just walk into City Hall. His friend Hans Walz, the general director of the world-renowned Bosch Engineering Technology and Household Appliance Corporation, referred him. During the Third Reich, with Robert Bosch's financial support, Hans Walz had funded Adler's efforts as head of the Mediation Bureau to smuggle Jews out of the country, a clandestine effort for which Valls would also be recognized among the righteous of nations. In the city hall itself, Adler met with Oskar Klub, who had been a military judge during the war, and at least towards its end, had worked with a defense lawyer to soften sentences of soldiers accused of political opposition or desertion. That defense lawyer was Arnulf Klett, Installed by the French occupation authorities, Klett was now the Lord Mayor of Stuttgart, with Klump as his personal assistant. A fearless and tenacious anti-Nazi lawyer, Klett had himself done time in 1933 in the concentration camp called Heuberg, one of the Nazis' first camps, situated in the Swabian Alp, some 100 miles south of Stuttgart. At this camp, Klett met fellow prisoner Otto Kaufmann, a communist who would spend the next seven years until 1940 in and out of the camps until he returned to Stuttgart as a skeleton barely weighing 84 pounds. Between 1948 and 1971, Kaufmann would serve as, as an SPD mayor of Stuttgart for the economy. And in this capacity, since the city owned property in Puttenhausen, he too would have a decisive influence on negotiations between Stuttgart and the village. Now, there were other people in that obscure concentration camp. I'm just going to say the name of Kurt Schumacher and, um, and Fritz Bauer. It is not necessary to ret retrace all the meetings between Karl Adler and the Stuttgart officials. In August 1959, a group of them traveled with Adler to Buttenhausen. Joined by Otto Greta, the village mayor, Paul Stäbler, the director of an evangel 
evangelical home for the outcast in the nearby town of Ura. The group walked through the streets considering various possibilities, all of them involving plots of land that the city of Stuttgart owned. For various reasons, none of these worked out until they happened upon a dilapidated house at Hauptstrasse 28, right in the center of town. It was the birthplace of Theodor Rothschild, the longtime director of the renowned Israelite orphanage, orphanage in Esslingen. The Nazis had infamously ransacked and plundered this orphanage during the November pogrom, and in 1942 deported Rothschild, who had worked tirelessly to save his many children to Theresienstadt, where the Nazis killed him two years later. The house now belonged to Theodor's niece, Helena Rothschild, the only survivor of the Buttenhausen Jews trapped in this village after 1941. Now in her mid-80s, living on a farm outside New York, and with no plans on returning to her native village, she was more than happy to sell the house to the city of Stuttgart, which offered to buy it as a teardown. The memorial may well now be considered secure, Adler wrote to Otto Bernheim on September 7th, 1959. By the following February, the house was empty. In April, the county gave the green light for its demolition. And in November, 1960, it was raised. The Lord Mayor of Stuttgart now pressed for a timetable for the erection of the memorial and set it for early summer 1961. The stone still had to be carved, the list of the deported and murdered finalized, and Jews of the Jews of Buttenhausen invited, and an epigraph agreed upon. The various parties eventually settled on three columns, with the front of the middle column adorned with the words to the brothers and sisters. Uh, of the Jewish congregation of Buttenhausen, who as victims of National Socialist persecution were forced to lay down their lives, 1933 to 1945. The two flanking columns then listed 44 names, starting with Naftali Berlinger, who remained in the village, insisting, I am staying with my community until there are no more Jews here. The stone also included the four Buttenhausen Jews who committed suicide, a suggestion of Guttenhausen's mayor, Otto Gretel. At a quarter to one in the afternoon on Sunday, July 16th, 1961, buses headed to Guttenhausen pulled up to Stuttgart City Hall. The city officials, the Stuttgart Cantata Chorus, and perhaps Karl and Greta Adler as well, boarded and headed south. Depending on the route taken, they likely passed below the neo-Gothic castle of Liechtenstein on their right, and the distressing euthanasia complex of Grafenich on their left before arriving in picturesque Buttenhausen. The ceremony began in the late afternoon with the music of the chorus, followed by a series of speeches. Then Karl Adler stepped up to the podium, imposing even in his early 70s, tall at a time when many were not, and with a resonant voice, Karl Adler gave his first official speech on German soil since his forced departure. He chose to speak about Heimat, or home, and its many shades of meaning, including as the resting place for the dead. Through the thickets, he could see the Jewish cemetery of Budenhausen clinging to the slope of the hill. But on this day, he did not mean those whose resting place was secure and known. Rather, his thoughts went to those with an ashen grave dispersed in the clouds or packed in unmarked ditches and covered in dirt and lime somewhere in Latvia. Adler then reminded his listeners that the Jews of Budenhausen had loved and worked hard for a village that was theirs too. He reminded them that some Christians in Budenhausen <clears throat> helped Jews in need <clears throat> while others proved cowardly or worse. He told them that in the 1940s, the Jews in Budenhausen living in New York gathered together and talked about, talked only about, quote, the old Heimat and the fate of our relatives and friends, unquote. And he said that more recently, the Jews of Budenhausen in New York had thought there should be a memorial and asked Guttenhausen Jews in the whole world to contribute. Originally, the memorial was supposed to be for all the Jews departed from Guttenhausen, but this would have required chiseling over a hundred names into stone. Faithfully, since other Jews from nearby cities whom the Nazis concentrated in Guttenhausen would not be commemorated until the 21st century, one had to limit the names to the native Jews of this village and a few Guttenhausen Jews who were deported from elsewhere. Here too, there was a selection and hometown was the deciding factor. 
to Adler and the Jews of Buttenhausen, home took on a religious arc. It was where the cycle of life began, and it was where it should have ended. Since they cannot find a resting place, Adler said, they should at least receive a memorial, which should also inform later generations of the history of our era. The written out names were his talismans. We wanted to bring the victims back through that which can be brought back, the names of the day. Adler told his audience and concluded with, quote, the dead of Buttenhausen stand for the four and a half million Jewish men and women and the one and a half million Jewish children who perished because they were Jewish. Our Kaddish is for them, unquote. Few Buttenhausen Christians were in attendance. At half past five in the late afternoon, the officials from Stuttgart in the Cantata Chorus, perhaps Karl and Greta Adler too, boarded a bus and returned to the city. The village went about its business. Let me conclude with a few brief reflections. Buttenhausen fulfilled almost every possible precondition for becoming one of the first post-war small towns or villages in Germany to extend genuine and public empathy to its former Jewish inhabitants. A large Jewish population lived here. During the darkest period of Nazi rule, Christians, including the mayor and a number of other people in positions of authority, engaged in genuine helping behavior. And even after the war and the genocide, there were ties through visits and letters to the old Jewish community. Adler himself had a number of friends in and near the village. Moreover, in the 1950s, local leaders in Buttenhausen, including the village mayor and the Protestant pastor, wanted to help Adler in his quest to erect a memorial. From the standpoint of the politics of Holocaust memory, Buttenhausen seemed as if blessed with a royal flush. But there was resistance, and it came, quote, from the middle of the village council, as the official protocol put it. And this resistance trumped the considerable goodwill this little village possessed. The first small town or village memorial to the deportation was therefore not really a hometown memorial at all. Rather, it was an undertaking of Jews in the diaspora and major figures in the city of Stuttgart. The diaspora community was extremely well organized, modeled on Yiddish mutual aid society, Landsmannschaften. The Buttenhausen evening had remarkable connections in Israel and in Germany, and especially in Stuttgart. The connections worked partly through survivors, such as Josef Vasha, the executive director of the Jewish religious community in Württemberg, who had endured five years of Buchenwald, and Alfred Marx, Greta, Greta's brother, actually. Even more significantly, these connections came together in a group of highly placed non-Jewish Germans, most of whom, including the Lord Mayor, had suffered at the hands of the Nazis. In the pre-war period, Adler had been linked to these men through his musical activities and as director of the Mediation Bureau. Some, like those connected to the Robert Bosch Foundation, had even made Adler's work possible. In turn, after the war, Adler became one of the most careful writers of affidavits testifying to the comportment of German officials in Württemberg during the Third Reich. Friendships forged in resistance to the Nazis and compassion for the region's victims remained strong, but hometowns native villages had become unheimlich, not home, not welcoming, without or with little compassion. Rancor over what is mine, what is yours in short property did not help. But did the memory work of Karl Adler and his transnational networks change any of this? What difference, after all, does a memorial make? Two years after the consecration of the memorial, Hans Schweitzer, the new mayor of Buttenhausen, trudged up the hill towards the Jewish cemetery stopping at the bleak and empty plot where once a synagogue stood. An oppressive, feel, an oppressive feeling came over me, Schweitzer wrote in a letter to Adler dated November 14th, 1963. I imagined that a stranger would walk by here and not know about this place or all the things that happened in our town 25 years ago. A bronze tablet or something appropriate should be placed here, Schweitzer suggested and asked Adler for his opinion. Adler brought the issue to the Buttenhausen group in New York, and they expressed great interest in Schweitzer's idea. But they also knew that there had been a wearying tussle over the school building bequeathed to the town in 1903 by Levan Bernheim, and that Adler had corresponded for years about the use of this building, often never, never receiving answers. Now, all of a sudden, the new mayor had an epiphany about the Jewish history of this village. Understandably, the Jews of Buttenhausen were suspicious. 
a back and forth ensued. The village council got involved, as was its grip. Old ideas surfaced. Some council members pointed to the financial difficulties. We, not, we need not adjudicate. Um, I should also say one thing. Um, this second round of negotiations was an involved yarn, and for reasons of time, I won't get into it more. It also included a strongly worded accusation that Schweitzer was hiding his Nazi and SS past, and that his real interest was to get the Jews of Budenhausen to allow the offices of the town hall to move into the school building. And we need not adjudicate this dispute here. Adler's Christian friends in Budenhausen, including Paul Stäbler, assured him that it was a good idea to trust the new mayor and to move forward. They were probably right. And on September 4th, 1966, Buttenhausen unveiled a monument for the destroyed synagogue. It's one of the very early ones. Were mixed motives concerning property involved? Almost certainly. Did the town participate this time? Yes. Adler came back too and held another speech, speaking not of Heimat or home, but of the necessity of facing the past honestly. Newspapers picked up on this theme and praised Buttenhausen as a model village. The story, as we have seen, is of course much more complicated, but Schweitzer sent images and texts of what was by all accounts a moving celebration back to New York. And in the gathering of the Jews of Buttenhausen, tears rolled down aged and worn countenances. Sometimes a small bit of honesty, a small step, however imperfect, is better than no step, of, step at all. History books, especially those about memory, love to note that more could have been done. It is one way that historians exercise criticism, but sometimes it is important to see that anything was done at all, and that Buttenhausen would in time become a village that worked hard to face its past, as Jews in the United States, Israel, and elsewhere have attested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helmut. Lots of things for us to consider here. Michael, uh, you're going to uh, kick off the discussion uh, with some responses. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Gab, and thank you, Helmut. I uh, really appreciate um, what you're doing in this book and sharing your work in progress with us. I think it's incredibly important to go back, especially to the time which you shared with us today, the 50s and early 60s, a time that often I think falls through the cracks of history writing where we have now a lot on the immediate post-war period and then starting, I would say again, late 60s and 70s. Um, but I always find this period so fascinating for many reasons because it seems that many historians don't find it fascinating but i think it's 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 definitely one of several works um in progress that try to shed more light on german and german jewish history of that time so i want to make three points <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry or it may be better to ask three questions um i would sum summarize them as uh whose heritage are we talking whose history and whose memory um, and of course, they're all very much interrelated. Uh, whose heritage? Uh, and I, I think I really mean heritage first and foremost here as material heritage. Um, you had one sentence towards the end of your paper talking about the rancor over what is mine and what is yours. And that was, I think, meant in terms of material property. Um, and the question of who are the actual heirs, <clears throat> not, uh, sorry, not of the history, we'll come to that in a moment with the second question, but of the material remnants of this collective property um, of the Jewish communities is, of course, a very relevant and also very complex one right after 1945. There were different claimants. There was the well, there were, as we heard from you, the local Jewish organizations like the Buttenhausen kind of Landsmannschaft, the Buttenhausen group of Jews in New York, um, the organization of the Jews of Württemberg in the U.S., but also the Association of Jews from Central Europe 
um, as they called themselves later, in Israel or in Great Britain. So the the former, the Jews who had emigrated, the former Jews of that town, um, there was the new Jewish community uh, in Württemberg. There's only one in Stuttgart, but it, every other Jew in Württemberg, um, if he, you know, or she declares to be Jewish, is part of this uh, Württemberg Stuttgart Jewish community. Uh, Israel, right? Israel had claims too. The Irs or other succession organizations that were built after World War II in the different um, occupation zones of Germany. So what about the local town, right? So that, of course, you mentioned that as well. Uh, and um, uh, maybe that's something to, 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 to talk a little bit more, uh, maybe even when we talk later, but also to mention the book, who actually owned the schoolhouse? Who owned the property where the synagogue stood? Who owned the cemetery? Uh, I assume the new Jewish communities. But, you know, all that, um, these questions, I think, are very complex and often not even totally settled until the mid or late 1950s. There were quite a few um, court procedures where one uh, where two or more of these parties I mentioned before went to court, to German court sometimes, to fight about whose property. And that's really but material property. Um, also, um, uh, an interesting sentence or an interesting passage, I thought, was when you talk about how the town was suddenly poorer. Um, they, because... The Jews um, left. Um, the town now was poor. Uh, you know, I, immediately the image that came to my head was the Hugo Betauer story, um, the city without Jews. And that's, of course, a fictitious story 19, written in 1922, where Hugo Betauer writes a, 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 a utopian or dystopian novel where he depicts the um, um, expulsion of the Jews uh, but then they're called back because it's so um, it's so impoverished the city. Um, so I was just asking myself, um, what is it? Maybe a little bit more complex than than the town was suddenly poor. Um, I would imagine there were quite a few townspeople who enriched themselves with the belongings of those who had left. Could the Jews really take all their property with them? Probably not. So maybe that's one point where I think it would be interesting to discuss again the complexity, um, and um, and 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 of course you know it's always a, a very sensitive issue when we talk about um, like Beta or did uh, Jews and and now you know they're taking their their wealth with them. So that's something which I found very interesting and maybe worth a little more attention. Um, a second question would be whose history? And of course the material conflicts often overlaps with questions of history and memory conflict. Um, and as you said, silence was the main response in the first year, at least in this chapter, I don't know your other chapters, but it seems to me that this is still true when we, even if we revisit uh, the sources and the history of the 50s, that uh, there was a lot of silence. There was a lot of um, feeling uncomfortable in facing the past um, in Germany, of course. And um, one of the questions I'm sure the book is addressing um, in its different chapters, when did that change? What kind, um, um, what were the important events or processes that led to a change? Um, also, what kind of local history was written in, um, in, in local accounts of the town's history in the 50s and 60s? Usually, as we know, the years 1933 to 45 were either left out or got like a few lines. What was taught in schools about it? Um, and then, um, of course, the question you also touched upon, 
whose history, whose history was the history of the local Jews? Was it a history non-Jewish Germans um, would even be or feel able to face yet? And I, I wrote down a quote here from 1952 um, from German historian Wolfgang Treue, who wrote in a review of Selma Stern's The Core Jew, um, quoting here, questions concerning Judaism, no matter if they are of political or historical nature, are understandably taboo in today's Germany. The suffering that millions of Jews had to endure by Nazi Germany arises in front of every occupation with them. So when we talk about historiography, um, it, it, I think this Treue quote in the Historische Zeitschrift um, was quite representative for most German historians that you can't really, we can't really touch this yet. And, you know, understandably. Um, but what's largely forgotten, and I think you, in a very, very impressive way, point to it um, uh, in this chapter, is that actually it were often Jews um, who wanted to keep this history alive. They thought this is our history. And you um, wrote about the local Jews who came back and built the first memorial, the first monument to, in a way, their own community. Um, I was also thinking of historians who in the 1950s, sometimes even the late 40s and 50s and 60s, came back to Germany and started to write German Jewish history, names that are mm, largely forgotten today and maybe weren't even well known then. Hans Lamm, who later became the president of the Jewish community of Munich. Stefan Schwarz, another, um, another community worker in Bavaria. Um, he was an East European Jew, interestingly. Bernhard Brilling, a rabbi who left Breslau and came back to Münster after the war. They all wrote accounts of Jewish life in Germany um, without being, I would say, admitted to the Zunf, to the profession of historians. They were not professors, and they even had difficulties in writing, in often in, in, in gaining access, access to archives and so on. The, of course, the best known example is Josef Wolf, as um, Nicholas Berg has written in, 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 in an impressive book. Um, Joseph Wolf, who was also actually of East European background, um, he deeply, he was deeply marked by his Holocaust experience and um, very disappointed by <clears throat> West German society. And he belonged to those who basically regarded as his own mission to teach Germans about the, in, in, in his case, it was about the Nazi German experience of of Germany and of Jews in Germany, he was hope he thought it was hopeless, and um, he, as we know, jumped out of the window of his Berlin apartment in 1974. He left a letter to his son in which he wrote, "I have published 18 books about the Third Reich, and they have had no effect. You can document everything to death for the Germans. There is a democratic regime in Bonn." Yet the mass murderers walk around free, live in their little houses, and grow flowers. Um, so what you do in this chapter, I think, is to show the micro level of this development by pointing to, in a way, the disinterest and the uncomfortable feeling of the Buttenhausen population, while the local Jews actually care about their history and are the first ones to in this case, not write about it, but to um, remember it. And um, finally, <clears throat> I would uh, ask the question, whose memory? And here, I mean to talk about public memorialization. And um, I, from what would be my own assessment, I would say, Buttenhausen really seems to be an exception, an exceptional case that former Jews took the initiative to memorialize uh, their former presence so early on that, and, and you show, of course, that they did so not 
in the public town space, but in their own sacral space, um, and in this, you know, the cemetery. And only later does it change and become the public. And who pays for it? Well, that I found fascinating um, that they have to turn, or, or maybe they don't even have another thought, and maybe they don't want to turn, that I don't know, to the non-Jewish um, authorities. They go to Otto Bernheimer in Munich, and um, and he pays um, a, a large amount of money to make this possible. Uh, so I found this very interesting. And again, I want to take a, an example where I think this, which reflects it on the macro level, uh, an example I think which plays a role in another chapter of your book, and that's the commemoration of the November pogroms, which of course in, in this time was still called the Kristallnacht. And again, in 1948, it was basically only the Jews uh, reminding uh, themselves and, and the Germans um, of what happened 10 years earlier. In 1958, we have um, participation of non-Jewish uh, groups, but it's, again, um, it's not a major event in German society. A newspaper, a, a journal like the Spiegel or the Stern didn't even report about it in 1958. And in 1968, it's totally overshadowed by the 50th um, anniversary of the end of, um, of World War I. And only 1978, for the first time, a German chancellor, Helmut Schmidt, um, actually presides over a ceremony in the Cologne synagogue. And then in 1988, it becomes, it, it's the 50th anniversary, and that it's actually even in East Germany for the first time, um, it's, it's a major um, act of commemoration. Uh, of course, uh, in a way, tragically, um, or ironically better, uh, overshadowed, by what happens then in 1989 on the same day, namely the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, so, and, and, and let me say one last thing, um, which is more personal. Of course, um, much of what you um, describe remind me of what I um, was able to observe in the town I grew up in, Bavaria, in Weiden, um, where um, I remember when I started as a high school student to write about the history of the Jews in this town in the early 80s, I think it was even 1980 or 81. Um, and then later that became um, a, a book. Um, and, and, and there was an, a lot of uncomfortable feelings still in the town uh, about it. Um, and it was, I think, eight years later in 88, um, when I, together with other people, initiated an invitation of former citizens uh, of this this city into back to Weiden, um, that already had changed. I mean, the 80s, you could even see how much resistance there was still in the, like, 1981. And by the late 80s, um, that seemed, I would say, the right thing to do, because so many others by then also had done it. And it was fascinating to see, and again, I had Buttenhausen of the 60s in my now in my head, but this is Weiden, a little larger town in Bavaria in the 1980s, where um, the Jews came back, and also it was it was moving because they met many of them met the first time since the 1930s when they had left uh, as a group again. And I I, I wanted to ask you, um, are there also um, does does that happen, and when does that happen in Buttenhausen? Um, and I think that's, uh, let me conclude by when you said, um, I, I think that's the, is that the current title of the book, How Jews and Germans Made the Memory Culture of the Federal Republic? I think that's really the important, con one of the important contributions, what you're doing. It's both. I mean, of course, it's not necessarily Jews or Germans, but they were German Jews, but the, that, the, the, that there was that Jewish contribution to it in the 50s and 60s that we often tend to overlook. And I, that comes out so clear in this chapter. Thank you, Michael. Kamu, do you want to have a couple of responses and then I can um, refer to some of the questions? Uh, <clears throat> uh, sure, there's, there's so much uh, here. 
Michael, thank you uh, for your reflections. Um, let me just try to respond with a, a, a few comments about this. One is that Buttenhausen sort of did have such a reunion. Um, there was a, an important person um, in this town. He was not born there, moved there after the war, named Walter Ott, who was a farmer. Um, and he started taking care of the synagogue. Uh, he, uh, I'm sorry, of the cemetery. And uh, more and more Buttenhausen Jews um, came to realize this and, and he has a, an involved uh, correspondence um, about this. But he also discovered in the, in the 70s, the, um, uh, the, the writ of protection that the local um, baron had given to the Jews in order to settle in this little place. And that was seen as a huge discovery for him, the town, the Jews of, of Buttenhausen. And after that, he became in a way the local historian, um, but the person whose local history in, brought the Jewish history and the Christian history uh, together. And they invited a number of people. It wasn't a full on, um, uh, invitation like in Leiden and many other places, also in Württemberg, Laupheim, Kreisheim, um, and Tübingen and, and so on. Um, but it was an invitation and a number came back. There, there was a circulation that went on for many years, also in the 60s and 70s. So I agree with you that those invitations, I, I recently gave a talk on my chapter, my first draft of that chapter, uh, because I talk about that as well. Um, I think that that it, it was interesting to me that you, you bracketed one set of comments under the term history and one set of comments under the, the third, under the term memory. And I struggle with this, um, uh, throughout what is history and what is memory and what is the different kinds of, of work. Um, one thing that will happen in this manuscript is I will talk a lot about what I call history um, or the creation of history. And that involves things like figuring out from the archives who was deported. Um, it involves things like figuring out what happened to the Jewish community. A lot of these communities didn't know there was archival work involved. Um, and there was a lot of figuring out what actually happened in these communities. So there is, in my way of thinking it, about it, a good deal of history that has to be done for these memory um, cultures to really, uh, really work. And yet I still think that it's, it's, the tension between the two is interesting. But I think that one of the ways that both Germans and Jews in the diaspora bridge the two concepts is by a word which is very unfashionable in German studies and in the academy, and that's Heimat. And because they, they that word Heimat expresses this sharedness. It says, it's not just my history, it's also, you, you know, it's also your history, but it centers on this place and it centers on our recollections of this place almost always those recollections are the recollections of people in their, from their childhood on the side of the Jews. So obviously they, are, they tend to be nicer recollections. There are important exceptions um, for the pre-Hitler period. So, but basically there's this notion that this is something that potentially brings people together. And I think that's one of the reasons why Adler uh, spent so much time talking about what Heimat means to them. Um, it was interesting to me to find that in 66 already, he's already using this different vocabulary, but I think that over time they they overlap. Finally, last, last thing, um, I agree with you about how complicated the, the um, property issues are. They're complicated 
differently from town to town and even within town, from material object to material object. It's different for the synagogues than it is for the cemeteries, which as you say, get regulated a, a little bit later. It's also different for the houses. But I do think that one has to work through uh, these questions of property because I think that it's very difficult to get this memory um, for, for this me memory culture to begin to work until those are somewhat regulated. Um, because I think that they do on both sides bring up ill feelings, justified, not justified, and it made it difficult in the 50s um, to work through these issues. So that's, again, thank you for those comments. Great, so I have several questions here. I have several questions of my own as well. Um, <clears throat> maybe just to sort of um, split the difference, uh, Helmut, um, and this is drawing on one of the questions that's been submitted as well, but it's something I was thinking about. Um, while your presentation and Michael's comments focus mostly on the sort of internal um, bottom-up uh, motivations, both of Jews, uh, German Jews and, and German Christians in Budenhausen and, and Baden-Württemberg more broadly, um, one question uh, involves whether you found in your research, uh, and by the way, not just in Budenhausen, but beyond, uh, in small German towns, whether the international context of the 50s and early 60s ever shaped or drove the motivations of the of the figures involved. So for example, whether the debates over Wiedergutmachung in the early 50s, the debates over new episodes of anti-Semitism in 58, 59, early 60 with the swastika wave epidemic, not to mention the capture of Adolf Eichmann. Um, obviously at the national level, Adenauer and other West German leaders felt the need to really demonstrate a certain sense of vigilance about preventing anti-Semitism. But was there any way in which some of these national and international events shaped the motivations and goals of people who ordinarily or otherwise would maybe just be driven by their personal memories and feelings of Heimat and so forth? Yeah, thanks, Guy. That's a both a great and a really difficult question because the local sources don't tell you a lot about that, right? I mean, they really... Uh, there isn't a lot of speechifying about this the sort of thing in the village. Um, I do think that in that moment that you go one level up, you see it more. I mean, one has to remember that the moving forces also for Buttenhausen were not really uh, for the 61 monument of Buttenhausen, but actually the central figures in Stuttgart, um, one could, um, I had to cut some stuff out, but the, you know, Theodor Heuss actually sent his regards to this ceremony in 1961. Um, he followed it from, from the beginning. He had close ties to um, the Württemberg Jews, and especially those from Heilbronn um, in New York. So there is, in a way, in the 50s, there is an international um, circulation going on. And that international circulation is, of course, reacting to the, the larger, larger politics. Um, it is, however, interesting. So and ordinarily, one can start talking about this turn um, in 1959, 1960, with that SWAT sticker uh, uh, epidemic that starts in December 1959 in Cologne and spreads elsewhere. Um, but interestingly, this Memorial. I mean, that's why I quoted um, Adler writing to Bernheimer saying, we've got it in the bag now because he wrote that before that episode happened. Um, I should have maybe made that a little bit more clear, but um, the, the, it, was, it was important for me because I think that it helped me understand that some of these processes are going on well before uh, those moments that we think of as conventional markers and that they just happen to come to fruition. Now, maybe not just happen. I mean, maybe Klett is actually, and there is a, um, there, the Stuttgart City Council does talk to Klett about this um, and says, the SWAT sticker stuff is going on. What are we doing about it? And he says, well, we're doing something in Buttenhausen, for example. Um, and it's at that time that he also, 
that, that another person, um, also another really interesting um, figure in this kind of Nazi persecution world, a man named uh, Josef Ebele, who is the is the uh, herausgeber, the um, the not the editor, but the, the maker of the Stuttgarter Zeitung. He is publisher. The publisher, thank you. <laughs> he is the person who who pushes this. He is the person who questions it. He's in a mixed marriage with a, a Jewish woman from the little village of Rexing, another one of these villages. Um, he's actually even in hiding in a Jewish village in the 30s um, after being released from concentration camps. So there's a lot of this stuff coming back in and these are the people who are taking these, these important steps. And yes, they have a different, different horizon. Um, and so I think that there is a lot about the larger, but it doesn't always match up in terms of the local time-wise. Mm -hmm. Relatedly, there's a question about what we can learn about, say, the small town German confrontation with this burdensome historical legacy of, of the Nazi years that we might not learn from the encounters uh, in major metropolises, whether Hamburg or, or Munich or, or Berlin, um, not to mention the question of how maybe as you zoom out to really the bigger question of periodization, does your, will your study um, offer a new way of thinking perhaps about this long uh, question of how the Germans have over time slowly but surely come to terms with this past or failed to do so or somewhere in between. Um, the small town focus on place, by definition, small towns maybe have a more limited but maybe more intense sense of place than massive metropolises with multiple neighborhoods. Is there something, are there any working theses you're, you're, you're reflecting on or considering that might um, help shift our perspective by looking at these kinds of towns? Yeah, um, I, I think that one of the most important aspects of uh, this confrontation at the small town level is that people know each other. Um, they know their parents, they, they know the Jews who go back, know exactly who was a Nazi and who was not. There was, they don't have a fuzzy, you know, broadly analytical sense of this. They know exactly which families, which kids did what and so on. They know that very precisely through the 50s and deep into the 60s. Um, some of them, by the time you get to these reunions, it's a little bit different because most of the people who come back for the re reunions were people who were little kids or, you know, teenagers um, at the time. It's just a matter of math and how long, um, how how much time passes. But in the fifties and sixties, that's very different. And so there's there's that aspect. They go back and they see who they're talking to. So there's much more of a personal element in it. The second is that I think that you can, um, you can see the way in which uh, issues of property and Wiedergutmachung and all of this um, really impact that the, the, the timeline of efforts at public memory in a way that's harder to see in in the big cities. Not that it's impossible to see, but that you can really see in a place like Buttenhausen in a very, um, uh, the German word is plastic kind of way, but that's silly, but you know what I mean? You can see in a granular sense. And um, to me, this is attractive because I guess what one of the things that when I came, came to this study, I thought, and I still think though, there are a lot of projects that are, are working on this now, um, I still think that we don't have very close social histories of, um, or what I would call micro histories of, of towns and the memory work. So I think we have a lot of spade work still to do um, in, in this. Whether it will dramatically alter our understanding of the big timeline, I used to think that more than I do now. Um, and I think we will certainly see that there are some aspects which we've overlooked. Um, I partially, one of those aspects is the important contribution that of returning Jews, whether after the um, Holocaust directly or as travelers um, 
uh, in, in later years, or as people who have remigrated. Um, in Ulm, that's an, an important issue. You will also begin to see very different actors than maybe the big intellectuals um, and the major politicians that we're always talking about. So I think that that's part of the payoff, whether or not you know the whole, everything we know has to be thrown out uh, that I, I'm looking for a more modest um, contribution. I'm just going to synthesize the last two questions and then obviously give you and, and Michael an opportunity for any final remarks um, to synthesize the two questions as follows. One uh, audience member wants to know whether, to the best of your ability to speculate, the history of the Jews in Butenhausen as far back as it goes, whether to the 17th or 16th century, is it quote unquote typical in any way? Is it exceptional in any way in terms of the Jewish contribution to small town German life? Uh, and another one asks um, maybe to take a little bit more of a comparative perspective and cross the border moving to the east. And I, no one would expect you to have the expertise in this necessarily. But if um, one would compare how Polish small towns um, have oftentimes blocked uh, the efforts of um, Polish Jewish exiles, um, whether at the local level or with the federal at the federal level from trying to regain property, um, is there any generalization you might be able to offer about um, the relative uh, pluses and minuses about the German and Polish experiences? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I will try to answer it as best I can. I, um, you know, the question of what is a typical town is, you know, we always make these uh, creations as if any place were typical. Every town is typical in its own little way. And so there's there's that, but there are, I mean, one thing to remember is that there was a time in German Jewish history when the majority of Jews in, in the 19th century uh, still lived in these kinds of towns. Um, we, in the course of the 19th century, because of urbanization, because of um, emigration to, to the new world, Oh, America, however you want to put it, America, United States, um, and because of relatively low Jew Jewish birth rates, um, probably driven by relatively uh, high, um, uh, that they were simply better off. Um, these shifted, and we now have an idea of uh, Jewish history that is much more centered on the big urban um, landscape. So, but it is also the case that it, even until the 1920s, there are a lot of Jewish villages, um, which by Jewish village, I mean villages in which there is a significant Jewish uh, percentage, 5%, um, 5%, 10%, in uh, um, close to 25%. So, so there are these phenomena are also very much part of the, especially the West German experience uh, from Franconia, Württemberg, Baden, um, the Rhineland Palatinate and, and up through the Rhineland, uh, and of course, Hessen and Frankfurt, uh, in the area around Frankfurt. So there is a significant swath of German territory where this is not something that's weird or atypical. Um, it's just that because of Jewish settlement par patterns, this is not true of all towns. But I think this, re if you have a certain um, critical, sounds funny to talk about it this, but if you have a certain number of Jews, enough who survived the Holocaust and who could come back and who, you know, in, in New York and Buttenhausen, there are more Jews in greater New York in 1950 than there are, than there were in Buttenhausen in 1933. So, so these, these communities, um, some of them do flourish and they flourish elsewhere. So I think, it's, I think it's complicated, but I think it wouldn't be right to call it atypical, but and I think it also beyond that, it tells us something because here's the place where you can see the contact, where you can see people coming back. Now to the Polish uh, comparison, I don't know this quite as well, but, um, it does seem to me that the, the experience of Jews going back to their Polish hometowns in the post-1989 um, era 
and dealing with these restitution claims and, and finding themselves pushed away. Um, I think rings like evocatively of what one would have expected of a somewhat earlier era in, in, uh, in post-war West Germany. Um, maybe that's a good sign that that could change. Um, but I think that the experiences uh, are quite typical that way, even though I think nowadays there's a, there's a difference. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Michael, any words of uh, wisdom, words of conclusion <laughs> that you wanna leave our audience with or? No, no words of wisdom. Um, I, I just, uh, uh, I was just uh, thinking of when you talked about Heimat earlier in your responses, um, that was so important also uh, when I reached out first in the early eighties to my my Biden Jews uh, scattered around the world. And it was so interesting, the range of responses. Um, when I asked them to share their uh, memories with me, um, and of course it's different because they knew it came from like a Jewish teenager, right? And, and that made a little difference, but they were still huge differences. There was one woman who um, basically answered me through her lawyer that uh, if I, you know, it's interesting. Later, I became friendly with her, but her first response was, this is threatening. And uh, uh, there was another one who just wrote a few lines saying, you know, I cannot talk. It, it was very close to him. I, I cannot talk about this and I don't want to talk about this. Uh, and that also, but most of them immediately came out with these, you know, it was all about nature because they didn't want to talk about the people, but the memories about Heimat, oh, the mountains and the the little lake and the beautiful food, of course, and all these things and the, the, the Wanderung and the hikes. Um, but they didn't really want to talk about very much about the people. Um, and uh, I think, you know, as somebody said, uh, uh, fauna, gut, flora, nicht, or so. So it's really, um, it's really this feeling of the, the, the big nostalgia and the missing of the nature was very, very, much a part of those yeah, early answers. Anyway, that was my not so wise <laughs> words. Thank you, Michael. Those those reminiscences, like Helmut's primary sources, are very uh, richly textured. And Helmut, I think we all uh, thank you for this presentation. We wish you, uh, you know, Godspeed in wrapping up this manuscript and getting it into publishable form so we can all read it. Thank you. Thanks, Helmut. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Till next Wednesday. Thank you.